Vegas Video Network Studios, just steps from the Las Vegas Strip, it's Top of the Food Chain. And now your host, he's one part mohawk, two parts attitude, and a touch of what the f***, it's Al Mancini. wait for Scott to cue you, really. I was excited about having an audience, and then they just sat there and waited for Scott to tell them what to do. Anyway, welcome to Top of the Food Chain. I am your host, Al Mancini, the only Las Vegas food critic who is nerdy enough to hang out at the Consumer Electronics Show this week, dirty enough to hang out at the Porn Awards next week, and will actually be cheering on a friend at the Miss America pageant somewhere in between. I dare you to do that, John Curtis. <laughs> Uh, welcome, welcome. We are on the um, Vegas Video Network. <laughs> I almost said Adult Video Network there. <laughs> We're on the Vegas Video Network. Um, home it's our, to it's our pay-per-view stuff. It's your pay-per-view, <laughs> yeah. Home to all of the finest, not dirty, not so dirty um, Las Vegas programming. We've got shows on just about everything. Golf, um, real estate, gambling, uh, just following drunks around town. Actually, we have two shows that are kind of like that. Scott shows sort of like that sometimes. We too. have three because of yours. Oh, <laughs> mine. <laughs> you don't really talk about me around town. I just get drunk here during the show. Uh, anyway, you can find all of this fine programming at VegasVideoNetwork.com. You can also find it. You can download everything at, um, at YouTube. You can watch it. You can download it at iTunes. We're on Roku. We're on live stream. Hopefully, you're watching us live on live stream. Plenty of places you can see it. All of my episodes are archived on my website, along with plenty of other cool stuff. And that is almancini.net. And of course, follow me on the Twitter, almancinivegas. You know, my dad, I think, stole Al Mancini. I think he has like three followers, and he's the guy that got my name. I have to be Al Mancini Vegas. Thanks, Dad. Um, so don't go. F uh, you know what? Follow my dad. Seriously. <laughs> he needs some friends on the Twitter. Um, anyway. Welcome to Vegas Video Network. If you have a question right now, we're talking pizza today. So um, I know everybody thinks they know about pizza, but we're going to get into some, some cool pizza stuff. Um, so get in the chat room. Just log on, and you can ask my pizza experts any questions you have. If you have questions for a future show, you can email them. That is food at VegasVideoNetwork.com. Ne Vegas and if you are listening on the radio, because we are broadcast live, not live, tape delayed every Friday, all of our programming at the Vegas Video Network is on KSHP 1400 AM. And you can um, dial in for a future, future question there at 866-966-4599. So that handles just about all the plugs, I think. Scott, did I miss anything? No, sir. Other than uh, you don't have to be a radio listener to use that toll-free number. Anybody can use it. Okay, anybody can use it. Well, I figured you weren't going like, to make sure they were playing the radio in the background or we, something. We, were, we used to do that. I also want to thank um, our sponsor, Bread and Butter, over in Henderson, one of the great bakeries slash sandwich shops of Las Vegas. Um, I'm thrilled to have them sponsoring us once again this week. Bread and Butter is a great place. Um, you go in, their bakery is amazing. I would seriously recommend the bagels if you really want some fresh bagels. And I'm coming from New York, so I know some bagels. There's, Chris Heron over there is making some incredible bagels. Check that out. Of course, there are also good sandwiches. I want to remind you they do a dinner thing with Ben's Barbecue every Wednesday night. It's one of the few times you can get dinner over there. And remind my chef friends that if you want a cool place for a pop-up, um, Chris is always excited about having people do pop-ups over there. So bread and butter, thanks again, once again, for being our sponsor. Scott, how are you today? Also, bread and butter just passed their 100-day mark, by the way. So that's pretty exciting stuff for them. I'm good. How are you? What you been up to there, Al? Uh, well, first of all, I'm a little bummed that they passed 100 days because I remember when Chris was on the show, he said that his goal was just to make it 100 days, and then maybe, maybe he'd just close up shop. So I hope that doesn't happen. No, he's still going but, strong after 100. I think he'll be OK. OK, great. No, man, I'm doing well, Scott. Um, I know your, your head's going to explode on this one, but you know, I've been promising people details of this for, for weeks and weeks. My porn star brunch has finally been dialed in. Are you excited? I, I like to, <laughs> you know, I, <laughs> what was my, I had a great line about wanting to keep one thing separated from the other, but I'm just Food and not, sex, you're not, not into no, merging I had a really the two? good rhyming line. Do you remember what it was? I don't think we can say that. <laughs> You'll be editing yourself out if you end up saying that. Oh, I just remember, I forgot but, it. Do you remember it? Well, talk for a minute. I'll see if I can remember it. Okay. Um, I want to give people the basic background. You know, I mean, food and sex, two things we all need. 
let's face it. And um, I've been covering the Adult, adult Entertainment Expo and the AVN Awards. You, you have it, Scott? I've got You're it. Excited? <laughs> okay. but I'm not sure. I, you might want to. You know, yeah. cover your ears there. I don't know that I want Boone next to my spoon. <laughs> oh, <laughs> see, that's just not right. Um, anyway, I've I've always wanted to do something like this. Joanna Angel, you know, I'm kind of the punk rock food writer here in town. Joanna Angel, a good friend of mine, um, who founded Burning Angel, Burning Angel, um, it was kind of the first punk rock porn star. Heavily tattooed, heavily pierced, all of her girls, my kind of women, tattoos, piercings, very dirty, um, do bad things on camera. And um, I, I know Sam DeMarco over at First Food and Bar, who's the guy that kind of brought junk food into the gourmet world. And I thought, we're all kind of kindred spirits. So the morning after the AVN Awards, which are going to take place on Saturday the 21st, Joanna and some of her lovely young ladies and myself are going over to Sam DeMarco's place, First Food and Bar. And I had the starlets call Sammy and describe the kind of food they like and put together a brunch menu. And this is just totally cool. If you're into porn stars and you want to actually sit at the table with them and dine with them, eat the food that they inspired, um, we put together an incredible menu. It's going to be literally five courses, one pass course, four sit-down courses. Um, we've got a cocktail pairing. And you get a copy of my book, Eating Las Vegas, all for the low, low price of $50. So um, it, it's a pretty cool deal. And you get to dine with porn stars which I think is just badass. So if you're into that, give a call over to First Food and Bar. There's a very, very limited number of um, reservations that we're taking. You need to make a reservation in advance. That's in the Palazzo, of course, First Food and Bar. And um, yeah, it's going to be a really intimate experience. So um, I just wanted to let people know the details. It's finally out there, and it's happening. Will you be there, Scott? Uh, uh, probably not. Have you looked up Joanna Angel just to see what no, she's all about? I don't even know what that means. I can give you a password to her site if you'd like to see. <laughs> yes, I'll take that. I mean, no. <laughs> I won't. Is Melissa watching, Scott? <laughs> I would like to not talk about this anymore. <laughs> Let's oh. go to a break and bring on our expert. From the man who rhymed poon and spoon, and now suddenly he's moral. Well, I don't know. It was Jacob's idea. <laughs> OK. I did. <laughs> we are going to, now that I've alienated all of my straight laced conservative viewers, we are, but guys, we're going to talk pizza in a second, and there's nothing dirty about that. Well, hopefully, Scott will come up with something to rhyme it with, but um, we've got a quick message, and we're going to have the guys from Dua Forney out here in just a second. Traditional media believes that after about three minutes, you'll tune out. Most Vegas media companies think if it doesn't jiggle, you won't tune in. At the Vegas Video Network, we think both are wrong. The Vegas Video Network is the first and only live online broadcast network that specializes in insider news and expert views about Vegas. We combine great storytelling with the ability to watch when and where you want on your computer, mobile device, or television. Discover the real Las Vegas. Visit VegasVideoNetwork.com. And we are back at the Vegas Video Network with Top of the Food Chain. Once again, I'm your host, Al Mancini. Joining me today, we have Alex and Carlos from, I think, what is my new favorite pizza place here in town, Dua Forney. Welcome, welcome, guys. Good, Good to, to have you at the Thanks show, man. Um, yeah, you know, we've been talking about this. You know, Cetabello had kind of raised the bar on pizza in this town over in the district. I still love them. They're in my book, Eating Las Vegas. Um, but you guys kind of came on the scene last year and really sort of rocked the pizza world. I mean, there's, I don't think there's any denying among serious foodies that you are the place on the west side of town. I mean, you know, Cetabella still has a lot of followers over on the east side. And it's kind of like a Todd's and Rosemary's thing like it used to be, you know. But um, I, I don't know. I think you may have edged them out in my book. As, as You guys do incredible pizza over there. Thank you. Yeah, uh, well, we love Cetabello. We uh, that's the favorite pizzeria. We used to go there all the time. So we had we to open a place because we couldn't make the drive anymore. It was just it was too long for us. But uh, in all, and we really like Cetabello. We love what they do, and we still love what they do. Um, but what we wanted to do was take was invite a lot more cuisine into the pizza environment. So we have incredible Neapolitan pizza. We did the we added the 500 degree oven to do the Roman pizza because uh, we learned that some people really hate Neapolitan pizza. <laughs> and they love the Roman style and nice and thin and 
crispy. There's, yeah, Roman style, which we'll get into in a few, is a very thin, almost cracker-like crispy Crack. crust. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, you do too, and that's, you know, dua forni literally translates into two ovens, two ovens right? right? That's what it means in Italian. Yeah. I took Italian in high school, but I don't remember I can remember tell much. you picked up on that yes. dua forni like that. <laughs> yeah, it took, I had to look it up, but um, <laughs> <laughs> my Italian grandfather would be, he's rolling over in his grave right now, but the fact that I'm here in Las Vegas, which is his favorite place on earth, I'm sure makes him more happy. <laughs> We, we worked together for, we started Fiamma together in 2003, and uh, we wanted to, we'd always talked about, you know what, let's just do a pizza place. Let's do a pizza place. We love great pizza. We love great wine. Let's do a pizza and wine place. And we had different iterations of the restaurant, but um, when we decided to add the second oven, that's when the whole restaurant changed, and that's when we left it up to Carlos to kind of take pizza and the two ovens, but now take those two ovens to do incredibly, incredible other stuff as well, which is... Yeah, it was super challenging when we first talked about it. I, you know, I was I wasn't sure if I wanted to do that, and then uh, we purchased an oven, put it in my backyard, and then every day I just cooked and made a lot of appetizers, and uh, it all started from there. So, um, yeah, and you, we we had John Curtis on last week on the show, and you know he picked as one of his favorite five dishes of the year your bronzino. You know, I, I haven't had the entree. You only have like two entrees. You've got a lot of appetizers and then two entrees and then various types of pizza. Well, available. pizza is the entree. Also right, but menu, two non-pizza entrees. Exactly. We do. Uh, we have the filet mignon on the uh, on the menu and the wild branzino, the sea bass. Um, but we do a pasta special every day. Almost every day, we run a different special. He's done. Um, what he's done? I mean, he's done a rack of lamb in there, pork loin, chicken, baked chicken, scallops. wild salmon, scallops, everything. You name. It. I mean. What I, people say, oh, I didn't realize you could do this in a pizza oven. And what I always say, look, these ovens weren't built to, to make pizza. You know, I mean, they're hundreds of years old, five, 500 years old, and they weren't made to make pizza. They were made to, in fact, pizza was used as a baker's tool to test the temperature of the oven. They would, or the, they would take it, they'd throw it in there, and they'd see if the, it was hot enough or what the temperature was in order to cook what they were actually going to cook. And it was, a, I mean, a, they called it a peasant food forever. Uh, which is, I think, why we're kind of drawn to it, because uh, we're taking what was originally a peasant food and really bringing in incredible ingredients to, to do that. Uh, let's talk a bit about the history of pizza, because, of course, everybody thinks they know pizza. And I'm going to get into the types, because nothing makes people more heated than what kind of pizza they like, uh, except maybe where their favorite pizza is. I'm, I was bummed, I wrote recently, my favorite pizza place in New York closed down, and that was um, Famous Ray's on 8th Avenue and, I think, 12th Street. It's going to be replaced by a famous original Rays, but that's not the same. That's what I was going to say. There are like know? 10 other famous <laughs> Rays out there. They're so. <laughs> in New York. Yeah, you guys should have named it Rays, right. seriously, because from a New York perspective, it has to have the word famous. It always has to have Rays, and then either famous or original or, or both, it? you know, um, which is a whole other thing. But you know, people are very territorial about their favorite pizza place and their favorite pizza type. So we're going to get into that momentarily. Can we talk a bit, though, about the history of pizza? I mean, how far back does pizza go? As I understand, it's hundreds and hundreds of years Thousands. in some form. Nine, Thousands. Nine, I mean, they, nine, there are some people that think that was, it was, it goes back as far as the written word, where they, the, it comes from the word, pizza is a derivation from the word pita. So uh, pita, which, and so you have writings about there being cheese and honey on old baked flatbreads. So flatbreads go back thousands of years. Which makes sense. Once you've discovered bread, you're going to start right. putting stuff on it. Right. I mean, you know, exactly. And if you don't want to fold it over and make it a sandwich, you keep it flat and it's a pizza, right? And, and the, to, the tomato-based pizza comes from Naples. So when they, that's when they say, OK, well, that was the birth of pizza. Pizza with, um, you know, the margarita pizza was invented in 1889. 1889, right? Uh, and that's because the, the queen margarita. margarita. Yeah. Right. It was uh, originally. What would happen is they'd put dough, and then they'd put tomato on it, and maybe some other things, but not usually. It was just tomato, tomatoes and dough, and in it goes, and it was sold in carts. Uh, it's the late 1700s, early 1800s. But the, because the tomatoes, I mean, Naples has some incredible tomatoes. You know, originally exactly. they thought they were poisonous and throughout mm -hmm. Europe, so they didn't eat them, and it was really in Naples. The leaves are poisonous, I believe. Are they? I think. I'm not 100% sure, but don't eat any. Right. Right. So we check um, <laughs> well, if you're out there. I, I thought the leaves were poisonous. But for the longest time, tomatoes really weren't consumed that much at all in Europe. And then as they gained more acceptance in Italy uh, throughout the 1600s, 1700s, Late 1700s, when they first say it started going on what was traditionally known as pizza, but the, the, the a recognized date is 1889 when the first pizza margarita was served. And the, from there, that's where most American-style pizzas have gone from. from and that, that story, as I understand it, is actually pretty cool. The, the Queen Margarita was in Naples, and she brought the biggest pizza maker 
to town and asked him to, to come up with three varieties. And the one that he created, either he created for her or he already he had it. He wanted to imitate the, the Italian flag. Right, that's the how he came red, up white, and green. Exactly. So that's where he put the cheese on it, mm -hmm. sort of for the first mm -hmm. time. The tomatoes, of course, always being used for the red, the cheese for the white, and then the fresh basil Which you for love. the green. I, I love fresh basil on a pizza, but when I'm looking for street pizza, right. you, it gets a you little want. it gets a little gourmet with the right. fresh. You know, it depends what mood I'm on. You know, if right. I want to, if I'm at a famous raise, I don't want fresh right. basil. You know, I want to bend it over and I want you know shake on oregano and things like that. But but so it was the red, white, and green for the flag, and that's why to this day it's still the margarita pizza. Mm -hmm. You know, which you can get just about everywhere. Right. Then um, I think it was 1915. People, I guess, everyone will argue about who brought pizza to America, but there's a great pizzeria in New York City on the Lower East Side called Lombardi's, mm -hmm. and I believe they opened in 1915. They claim that they were the first pizza in America. Do you think they're full of it, or do you think they were? I, I um, <laughs> maybe uh, the first pizzeria. I mean, right. it's like saying, I mean, American Italian cooking is so diverse because people cooked with what they could get access to. So they certainly weren't the first person to put ingredients on bread in America, and whether tomato and cheese, where they opened up a restaurant called Pizzeria, maybe. Oh, th there's a great thing about Lombardi's. I used to work, I actually used to make pizza at CBGB's. That's where I'm wearing my CBGB t-shirt, the punk rock capital of the world in its day. And I used to toss pizza there. Uh, but right around the corner, really, was Lombardi's. And I had a good friend who waitressed at Lombardi's. Now, I don't know if it's, first of all, I recommend everyone, if you're in New York, the Lower East Side, go to Lombardi's. Incredible pizza. It's one of the few places in New York. In New York, you can get a lot of the street pizza that I love. Mm -hmm. um, but to get these almost artisanal style pizzas that you make and that a lot of high-end pizza places make, you don't find them at a lot of places, certainly not a lot of places that call themselves pizzerias. Now, what I was told when I was there and, um, you know, it kind of plugged into some of the restaurant industry is that... Because if you ran a pizzeria, the mob for a very long time kind of controlled it. You bought your cups from them, you know, for your soda. You bought your cheese from them. I mean, it was their distributors. And so to get that kind of artisanal buffalo mozzarella, if you wanted to do that in a place that called itself a pizza place, the mob wasn't selling that at the time, you know, in the 70s, 80s, maybe 90s. So it was like, no, you don't use that. You use grind it down mozzarella, you know, that comes in a plastic. But because the Lombardi's had been there, on the Lower East Side, right next to Little Italy, since 1915, they had enough mob connections that they didn't have to go and get the same cheese everybody else was buying. So um, to this day, it's still one of the few pizzerias in that neighborhood. I mean, now, I don't think there's as much mob control over things as there used to be back in the day, and I'm sure you can find more artisanal pizzas, but that was a kind of cool story that I remember hearing from people in the We industry. haven't got hit by the Summerlin mob yet. Not yet. Not, not yet. The Summerlin mob. very organized. Not yet. They can't find you. They're going around those <laughs> damn roundabouts. <laughs> <laughs> but Carlos was telling me actually uh, that, and which surprised me, that there are how many, maybe three major importers of buffalo mozzarella in the United States, that yeah. most of it gets cleared through those three organizations? Atl yeah, Atlanta, and, and there's only three that comes through the United States, and then clears through customs. Buffalo mozzarella, it is not like buffalo wings. It does not mean it comes from buffalo. It's actually comes buffalo from milk. the milk of a buffalo, is yes. how the mozzarella is Extremely made. healthy for you, high in protein, low, lower in saturated fat. It's higher, ha higher calorie content than cow's milk, but it's, ex it's uh, very low in saturated fat, almost none, and uh, great protein, B6, B12. It's great. Uh, cheese or d the milk is, is great for you. And we're, we really pride ourselves on, we are not only the only pizzeria in Las Vegas, but as far as we know, and we've looked at every menu out there, the only pizzeria that strictly uses 100% buffalo milk mozzarella. And when I say that, I mean no matter which pizza you order, if it is made with buffalo milk mozzarella. So the smoked affumicata is buffalo milk mozzarella from Campania. All of our cheese comes from Campania. Uh, no matter if it says mozzarella, it's buffalo milk mozzarella from Campania, not from uh, California or Wisconsin, which they have some products, which are great, but there's just, there's just no comparison between that product and the stuff from Italy. Now, as we're moving forward, so now we have Neapolitan. That's what we're talking oh. about. Um, it started in Naples. That's what Neapolitan means. That's where the queen was visiting. The margarita happened. That's what Lombardi's opened, a Neapolitan pizza. That is your thin, what most people would call a thin crust pizza, a foldable thin crust, a very, and what a lot of people call New York pizza, exactly. Neapolitan. I mean, those are your characteristics. There is an organization in Italy, I think about maybe 30 years ago, um, the, the Europeans are very strict about calling something a designation right. of origin, basically, yeah. of saying this comes, you can't call champagne, something champagne if it doesn't right. come from the Champagne Valley. It, DOP. The, it, right. It, it, yeah. um, so Naples kind of got behind that with very strict rules. 
and I forget the organization's name, but Vera Pizza Napolitana. Okay, Vera Pizza Napolitana, and you have to kind of get their seal of approval in Europe if you're going to call it Neapolitan Pizza. Um, they also have an organization here. Settebello is the only restaurant certified. in Nevada that has been certified by that Italian organization, which as is a being su subsidiary of the organization from Italy. Right. Yeah. So, and you need, I mean, there's, everything is involved there. The type of flour that you use, the type of cheese that you Mixer. use. The and, oven, wood fire. Okay, so it, could you explain under those strict guidelines, like what they, what I it believe it's the flour, the uh, cheese. Um, tomatoes. Tomatoes, a uh, wood fire oven, and then also the process of making the pizza. So you have to go from uh, the marble table, and then you have to pull it into the wooden paddle into the oven. You can't use a tray underneath? You, no, you can't use a roller. You can't use any, even, you can't use a planetary mixer. So uh, you have to have a specific type of mixer when you mix the dough. Flour, water, salt, yeast, that's all you can use. You no can, oil, no, no sugar. sugar. You said the type of tomatoes. Is it San Marzano? San Marzano. San Marzano. DOP. Greatest tomatoes out right. there, probably. Exactly. So. There are three different tomatoes, which they recognize. There are three different cheeses, which they recognize that can be used. Um, and then, yeah, they, they regulate it very closely, and they protect it. It's actually enforced at least in Europe, by the European Union. So you could say that you're Neapolitan pizza in the United States, and no one's going to come after you. But right. if you're in Europe, if you say it's Neapolitan pizza, it has to be. Much like we claim to make champagne in the United right. States, right. and they don't exactly. come after us because, right. you know, I don't know, I guess they feel they owe us one after World War II. They let us get away with stuff. Um, okay, so we had Neapolitan. Um, now there's another, well, there's what you make. Which, what, what do we have up next? The, the Roman? The Roman style. Roman style pizza, which has another name, which I looked up today. There we go, Lazio, Lazio. or mm -hmm. Roman style pizza. Mm -hmm. And that is, again, round, thinner crust, thinner even crust. the Neapolitan. Usually it's duck, so there's uh, no bubbles are formed. And it's uh, cooked at a slower temperature uh, to make it nice and crispy. A lower temperature? Lower temperature. Lower temperature. Lower and slower. Yep. So your two ovens are what temperature? Uh, one is a 900 degrees, and the other one's a 500. 900 for the Neapolitan, 500, 500 for, for the, the Roman. Roman, or the Lazio pizza. Um, what was I going to How long does a pizza take in an oven of that temperature? Uh, the Roman, about three and a half to four minutes. The Neapolitan, 90 seconds. Okay. Wow, 90 seconds. And Scott, you have a question. Yeah, Nate was asking about the Neapolitan pizza. It, does the, is the crust crispy, or is it soft, or both? Or? Both. Yeah, it's, yeah it's, I mean, it's definitely a foldable it's crust, foldable, as I say. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not, it won't snap in half if you right. try to fold it. Um, it is, it, it's soft, kind of mushy, but it'll often have a crispy end, Exterior. especially when but you do it in crust. one of the, you know, the real ovens. You know, when you get it off a, out of a gas oven, a lot of times it's totally soft, totally mushy. But if you do it in a real oven, it will have an outside kind of char yeah, on you the you got to make sure the bottom is nice and hot and then also the, the temperature on the top to get the, out, the outer edges nice and crispy. Right. And I like the bubbles in the crust. I love it. I like when the big giant we're bubble goes We're up. partial to Neapolitan. Yeah, I mean, that's my favorite style of... But, uh, you know, we did the Roman because we didn't want to alienate half the pizza-going crowd out there. So, right. and as you know, and what we're talking about is people are very serious about what type of pizza they like. Yeah. So. And now there's another one that's coming up. And I grew up with this being called Sicilian pizza. If we could throw it, it's a pizza al taglio, I'm told. Al taglio, taglio. How do you Usually it's made in a square sheet pan. Yeah, it's very deep. Mm -hmm. um, and you, it's square, rectangular, and really, really thick crust. Not deep dish, which we'll get to, but thick crust. And it's sort of like a focaccia style. Yeah, like a focaccia, focaccia. dough. Yeah. And uh, I'm told that in Italy, that's kind of how they sell the sliced pizzas. Like they just have the pan, and they just chop you off however big of a square that you want. Yeah, you usually that. walk up to a window, and they have the different style of pizzas. You take a little slice or square, they pop it in the oven for you, and they serve it right there. But I, why was I taught that that was Sicilian? Did that in, start in Sicily? Do you know? Because now I've, I've also read that it started in Sicily. It is the yeah. tradition. But Rome in has it. Rome also. has it as well. Yeah. Yep. They sell. The, you'll say it. But you'll buy it by the sheet. And so it's there. Sometimes there was initial confusion when some people think the Roman pizza is more like a Sicilian because they do serve it in Rome. Right. Uh, for us, the Roman or Lazio pizza is a thin cracker crust. Okay. And then now we move forward to say the 19. 40s, I believe. I'm not sure the year, but um, around in, in the 1940s in Chicago, someone who know, owns Pizzeria Uno, which we all know the chain, mm -hmm. Pizzeria Uno, decided to invent a completely American style of pizza, and that's the deep dish pizza. And you know why it's called Pizzeria Uno, right? Because they had two pizzerias. There was Pizzeria Uno and Pizzeria Due across the street. They, what, a Pizzeria Uno, the lore goes it took an hour to bake it. 
That, so, oh, really? so you needed to have, they called it pizza because it took one hour to make it. And if you go today in Chicago, it takes about 45 minutes for the pizza to come out. And they warn you and they say, just so you know, it's going to be about 45 minutes. And really? uh, so, so the lore is that that's why they call it pizza uno. But pizza due and pizza uno were competitors, but pizza uno was the, right. the first. So that's how does that differ in the way that you place the toppings and things like that, and and, and how you make the crust for say a deep dish? Like well, Chicago I believe style. what they do is um, first you have to pre-make the dough. Um, let it rise, almost like a focaccia style, and then they put all the toppings and they rebake it again. But the ingredients they put, a lot of people put a lot of olive oil, eggs, sugar to it. So it's a much heavier dough than a Neapolitan style. Um, I love the Neapolitan because it's a lot lighter. You can eat a whole pie and not feel full. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, the deep dish, and I don't want to offend anybody from Chicago. I know that you, you people are religious about your deep dish pizza out there. Not so much for me. I used to eat at Pizzeria Uno's in New York City for a while. Until I can I have about a them. slice, and that's it. Yeah, well, they make them really small when you get them at the Pizzeria Uno chain. And, you know, that's okay. You could split one of those. But then I discovered Lombardi's and, you know, and, and Ray's, and then that was all over. All over after that. Um, I want to talk about the ovens. Oh, wait, before we move on to ovens, Scott has a question. Yeah, Bill G. wants to know if they have any tips for folks trying to make a pizza at home. Oh, absolutely. So, some, we can, some we can endorse and some we can't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the toughest thing, temperature is so key, so you have to get it to 900 degrees. I mean, or as close as you can get it to that. And your house won't and burn your down. House won't, you, can't, you can't get it to 900 degrees. Right. So there is a way. But there is a way, but you will you will burn down your house, <laughs> so don't do this. Don't try it at home. Don't try it at home. Well, that's 900 degrees for the Roman pizza, right? No, for the, for the Neapolitan. Oh, okay. You can do a Roman. You, we, you can do a Roman in, at 500 degrees in your house. You need a good pizza stone, which you can get. And I always recommend go to Marshalls or TJ Maxx if you're not buying locally. Okay. Then go to Marshalls or TJ Maxx because they always have a pizza stone there, and you're going to spend you know a quarter of what you're going to spend at a William Sonoma or a Sur La Table. Uh, and it's the same exact thing. Right. So, um, but we, when we were doing it before, we decided, you know what, we're going to burn down our house if we do this. But uh, if you go online, it'll say if you hit the cleaning cycle on your, oh, on your, yeah. your oven, <laughs> don't do that. Don't, don't do that. <laughs> but uh, that gets it. That's how they. That's how they. You Doesn't clean. the oven usually lock when you hit the cleaning yeah. cycle? Well, there's a way that you. Okay, how about this? You just throw some gasoline <laughs> in your oven and um, firecrackers in there too. That will help. But you can do it if you can do it. A lot of people do it in their barbecues. Their barbecues can get. If you have a good barbecue with a high BTU, you can put a stone in there. Get it very, very hot. You can probably get it to about seven or eight hundred degrees. Um, so the key, that's really the temperature is key on the Neapolitan Roman. You can. There are great tutorials on the web. You can go on and. Uh, there are a bunch of different YouTube videos on how to make dough, and it's not it's not hard. And you know, I know people that buy Pana water, and they you know you can get Caputo at uh, Whole Foods has it sometimes. International market. Marketplace has it sometimes. And uh, but water very, has a lot to do with making the dough. Yeah. I mean, you know, we're, we've got we've got a pizza explosion going on here in town. One that everyone's very excited about is Dom DeMarco's. Mm -hmm. Sure, it's a competitor of yours, but I mean, we have to be, yeah. you know, it's kind of a rising tide. You know, Absolutely. the more people know there's good pizza in this town, the better it is for everyone, I think. Yeah. And Dom DeMarco's have reportedly hired a chemist to try to reproduce Brooklyn water because mm -hmm. Dom DeMarco is the chef at DeFara's Pizza in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. six, seven years in a row, named the number one pizza place in the Zagat Guide. That guy's not nearly as good as eating Las Vegas people, but if you're in New York, you're stuck with it. But no, it's been named the number one pizza. So they really want to reproduce that. So water is very important. Now, the person at home can't really hire a chemist. Would you recommend against using Las Vegas water? I mean, we have what I consider some of the worst tap water in the world in Las yeah. Vegas. It's just bottled water is the best way to go when you're making dough at home. Pana is great. Yeah. You can buy it pretty much anywhere. You can get it Costco or wherever you can get You can find Pana now, and uh, you can use that, and that'll be great. Uh, we have a system which... We didn't try to repro we tried to reproduce the pH and the purity of the water in Naples, and so we use a really well-regarded RO system, and then we run it through a coral filter, which gets it to where we need it to be. So. Um, and then when it comes to sauce, you recommend using San, San Marzano, Marzano tomatoes. tomatoes? Smith's has great San Marzano tomatoes. It's the big can. It's like... Uh, it's called Cento brand. It's a They're, yellow label. It's a DOP, and so you can get them. It's very fairly priced. San Marzano, now here's, I guess, the... Um, the common, you know, what people would think is it would be better to get locally grown fresh tomatoes as opposed to getting canned San Marzanos. But you would rather work with canned San Marzano tomatoes than fresh locally grown ones? Yeah, the sweetness and the balance of the tomatoes is incredible. We don't add any sugar to the 
uh, you're going to have to, anytime you get fresh produce, uh, whether it's local or not, uh, you're going to have varying sugar content in the, in the fruit. And so if you want consistent sugar content and not having to constantly be gaming it, then you're, the canned San Marzano's are the best. And the San Marzano's just have the right amount of tanginess. We try to buy locally as often as we can uh, for anything that we can get. There's some great new things going up locally that we're excited about once they get online, especially things like you can grow hydroponically like basil and uh, oregano and things like that. So, um, but yeah, but with, with tomatoes, tomatoes go don't mess, go don't there's, there's a reason that people, that it, people get it from there. It's like a Georgia peach or something. Right. It's just the best, right. so. Another question, Scott. Yeah, what is a DOP? Denomination or zone, and I forget what the, the P is. But it means Dragon. denomination of origin. Yeah, uh, it means basically that it is the it is the government standard for it came from a certain place. It meets a certain criteria. In wine, uh, you know, you have diff it's a DOC or DOCG, which is what a, one right. of the pizza restaurants it's here in town is named huh? after. Yeah, yeah, it's a protected. Yeah, protection. protection. Yeah, yeah. yeah protection. Yeah. 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 Denomination of origin, protection, protection. basically, yeah. and um, yeah. yeah, and it, it applies to anything from champagne needing to come yeah. from Champagne Valley to. Um, Balsamic vinegar having anything, to come from certain uh, regions. You know, prosciutto, Parmesan cheese, yeah. basically. So, did we have another question, Scott? Actually, Doug just told us what it meant. Yeah. Denominatio Origino Pro Teta? Yeah. Okay. It's a protection yeah. racket. Right. It is. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not going to slander my own people but with, by taking the bait on that one. Well, you know, I was listening to NPR and I heard that they've been uh, they were sponsored recently by the, the European Union for Parmesan and prosciutto de San Daniel and prosciutto de Parma. I mean, they're taking an active role because you can go to certain, re uh, certain supermarkets and you'll say it's, they'll call it Parmesan Reggiano instead of Parmigiano Reggiano. Right. So they're really playing on the DOP names and trying to, you know. Right. Well, Americans, yeah, we'll bastardize anything, and you know, people will buy it because it's cheap. I mean, you know, nothing that we call balsamic vinegar in this country is really balsamic right. vinegar, but we'll do a whole show on that some other time. I want to get to ovens, the type of oven that you use, mm -hmm. um, because most people in your hometown, your pizza place probably uses a gas oven. Right. A baker's and pride. There's these yeah. big things with giant doors and come down. I've got quite a few scars from working one of those ovens. I mean, I'm sure you probably have plenty of scars from your pizza I mean, oven, I mean, right? I mean, pretty good. I've been pretty good so far. Really? Yeah. Oh, man, you haven't been doing it long enough. Or either that or you're much There's better no at it than I am. Yeah, there, there is, is no, no door. door. That's Only <laughs> the, the pizza battle. So, you know, the gas oven is the standard. Mm -hmm. But the, the brick, the made of brick ovens that are either coal-fired or wood-fired, mm -hmm. I mean, that's what people think of when we're talking about really world-class pizzas, right? right? How does coal differ from wood, and how do coal and wood together differ from the gas oven? Well, one of the things that we, this is what we really worked on a lot and couldn't figure out what we wanted to do, because the Italians have really perfected the Neapolitan brick oven gas injection. And so uh, the reason for using coal and wood for the longest time was heat. You could not get it hot enough for a long enough and sustained period of time on gas to really get that char that you want. But when you bake on wood, when you grill on wood and it's slow and low, you get that, that flavoring from the wood, from mm -hmm. whether it's hickory or maple, whatever you're using. Right. Uh, but when you bake at 900 degrees, that draw is so strong that, that uh, smoke is going straight up. There's no contact. And oftentimes they say, really, uh, you, do you think you can taste the smoke? Oh, yes. Well, have you ever had coal-fired pizza? Yes. Does it taste like coal? <laughs> not, <laughs> not really. Uh, what you're tasting is that carbonization. And so that carbonization or char, uh, that you get on the pizza is what's key. And so when we built uh, Due Forni, we had an opportunity. We designed, the ovens we have were designed for us. And there are two key things about our ovens. Number one, we wanted to address um, hot spots in the oven. If you go to any Neapolitan pizzeria, go to Cetabella or anywhere else, you'll see them always moving the pizzas around. They're moving the pizzas around because they're turning it and dodging hot spots. And then um, the other thing they're doing is uh, controlling heat with putting wood in. And so every time you put wood in, you're getting a good 50 degree variable, minimum 50 degrees. The best will keep it at about 50 degrees. The worst will go up to 200 degrees. And so that's a problem because you can have a pizza cooked at 700 degrees and a pizza cooked at 900, totally different pizzas. Same everything, totally different so pizzas. So you're coming down on the side of technology yes. rather than tradition. classic and tradition and the art artisanship that goes in tradition. Okay. You know there are people out there who are screaming right now, yeah. pulling their hair out. I'm pretty sure. And um, you know, I should say, if you're one of those people, coal-fired, I think Grimaldi's does that right yep. here in Las Vegas. Um, 
there, you know, you can find those if you don't agree with these modern guys over here. <laughs> but no, I mean, because I'm not coming down on a side when it comes to what you should use. Um, you know, there are tradition. The, the, the traditional methods, you know, there's, there's some romantic spot in people's hearts for that. All right. It's beautiful. Being a pizzaiolo, that's the, the beauty of working that pizza. You put it in the hot spot, you work in the dome. That's, it's a beauty, you know. We did it. Um, we, think it's, we think it's better. It's more con a more consistent product. It's greener. Uh, we're not, you know, and also places have a tendency to cheat. If you go in at 4 o'clock, that oven is not 900 degrees. If you come in at 930, that oven is not 900 degrees. Um, with gas, you, it's always 900 degrees. But uh, I know you mentioned you were talking about the dough uh, and the ingredients and everything else. You think that it's more about? Well, a lot of people say that it's all about the dough. And I agree in, a, in some point, but I don't think it's all about the dough. If you have amazing dough and a low quality prosciutto, you're still tasting the low quality prosciutto. So I think a good pizza is a balance of good quality ingredients and a, and a balanced dough that complements those ingredients. Right. Um, how do you feel? I mean, the, the pizza scene really here in Las Vegas has been exploding recently. I mean, how do you feel about that fact? I mean, are we better off today than we were five, ten years Definitely. ago in Las Vegas? Yeah. Oh, yeah. The, uh, the pizza scene, not just that. I mean, the whole food scene. I mean, you, you know. I mean, you see yeah. it. What's happening locally is so cool, and pizza's just... Uh, it's hot right now, and so it kind of represents what's happening overall. But we agree, the rising tide, you know, lifts all boats. So we, we think that it's great, whether it's Dom DeMarco's or Settebello or anybody else, that we Grimaldi's, want people making comparisons. We great, want those people making comparisons. I was very sad to see Chow Chow disappear last year. I thought they were doing incredible pizza yeah, right in the neighborhood. Still, and he's still around, though. He's the chef at, uh, at Dom DeMarco's now. Oh, is he? Yeah, the head chef at Enzo. Was it Chow Chow? Open Chow Chow. Now he's right. the head chef at uh, Don DeMarco. Wow, you know, because I kind of went in there anonymously. I didn't introduce myself around. So that's great. That was great pizza at Chow yeah. Chow. Um, so it'll be sadly missed. Anyway, so there you go, pizza. I bet you thought you knew everything about pizza, and you didn't. Maybe we'll do a whole episode on salami one day, or pepperoni, excuse me, not salami. Because, I mean, come on, pepperoni, is that traditional? I Why? think we should do whose mother's meatballs are better. Is, oh no, man! My grandmother, my grandmother's not with us anymore. But she would strike me down if I said anybody's were better than her. I was talking to a cus, uh, guest yesterday, and they said to me, uh, "Everyone, this Nana has meatballs all over town. It's this Nana lady who's cleaning up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know who's collecting the royalty on Nana's meatballs." Nana's but we're glad go. that my grandma doesn't understand English, otherwise she'd be upset yeah. right now. <laughs> Um, again, guys, please check out Dua Forni. It may very well have become my favorite pizza place here in Las Vegas. It is in Summerlin, but if you're like me and you hate Summerlin because of the roundabouts, you'll be happy to know it's right on the verge of Summerlin. You can get there without going through a roundabout. You can, right, right off, off the, the 215. Two. Yeah, so, so easy from Henderson, easy from Silverado, wherever you're coming from, right off the 215, 50 feet off the exit on Town Center and 250. Thank you, gentlemen. Guys, I will be back, Nick. Well, in the meantime, we've got a couple of things coming up. Um, you can see everything I'm doing at almancini.net. Not com, it's almancini.net. That's where you can find the menu for my porn star brunch and more details and some pictures of the hot chicks that I'll be spending my time with. Um, I think next week, if all goes well, we're going to have a return visit from my friend Jeff Wyatt, and we're going to talk about port wine because International Port Wine Day is coming up. You guys do a lot of great wines. Do you do ports? We do. We, have, it's not a, we do more Amaros uh, and Grappas, but we have three ports. And, yeah, absolutely. Oh, I love Grappa. Yeah. Did I have Grappa when I was in? No, I don't think didn't. I did. We'll, we'll have to have you back in. And Grappa is so good. I used to have a friend back when there was a Yugoslavia. I'll be right with you people. Back when, <laughs> back when Yugoslavia still existed, um, he had a buddy that worked for Air Yugoslavia, and um, they would smuggle the Grappa over the mountains, and his buddy would bring it back, and I'd go to his place in Queens. This guy was very shall we say, and I always come home with a couple bottles of grappa, and we could light it on fire. That's how we know it was good. So yours is probably better, but... Um, I didn't think It's not song. illegal, but it's, it's better. Quick, <laughs> okay. Quick story about grappa. The funniest thing is it's made from the, um, the, the skins of the grapes. So after you would mash all of the grapes, and they would give the skins to the peasants. The winemakers would bring the peasants up, and the peasants would have to work, and the peasants would mash the grapes, and they'd say, okay, here you go, peasants, here's the skin. Go home and make this grappa, which is like fire water. And they'd, they'd make it, and the, you know, somebody would say to the lords, why are you giving that to the peasants? You, know, you could do something with it. And they'd say, the more grappa we have this year, the more peasants we have next year. <laughs> Basically, they would get drunk and make more peasants. So um, <laughs> on that note, I'm going to leave you. Please um, come back next week. We'll be here again with Top of the Food Chain. Oh.